The bread was very good, but then she did, like, the little, like, egg layer, and it was, like, a very fluffy egg layer, and there was some, like, arugula, and then she did some sort of aioli. I'm not entirely sure what was in the aioli. I think she did, like, a spicy aioli or something. Was it? There was, yeah, there was, like, a little bit of kick to it, and then she, like, candied some bacon and had that on there, and it was so good. What is aioli? It's mayonnaise that went to Harvard. (laughs) (laughs) But yes. (laughs) But he's not wrong. (laughs) Hey, welcome to the Tabletop Travel Guide, the podcast where we explore fictional worlds and civilizations right from the comfort of our own table. I'm Ryan. I've been playing TTRBGs for about 10 years. I am GMing a Pathfinder 2 campaign, and I'm also playing in a Starfinder campaign. And hey, I'm Tyler. I've been playing TTRBGs for also over 10 years, and I'm currently playing in two Pathfinder 2 campaigns, and I am GMing a third. And today, we have a special guest host, my lovely wife, Sam. Hey! (laughs) So I'm Sam. I have been playing tabletop games for about 10 years. Tyler conned me into playing 10 years ago, and unfortunately, it has never stopped. I think at this point, I am also in three different campaigns, and then I will do one-off GMing when our regular GMs are sick or out of town, uh, but I'm not currently running my own campaign at the moment. (laughs) Yeah, so you might have noticed from the title that this isn't a normal episode of the Tabletop Travel Guide. Um, Think of this as kind of a side quest from our exploration of Avistan. We've talked a little bit about some of the deities of Glarian, like our friend of the pod, Aridin, and in the next episode about Cheliax, we're going to talk more about Asmodeus, which we've mentioned, but he'll be kind of the central figure of Uh, the next episode. Definitely not friend of the pod. Definitely not friend of the pod. So we decided that this would be a good time to kind of pull off on the side and go off on the beaten path of our adventure and dive into some gods and deities of Galarian in this tabletop lore guide episode. Mm -hmm. So Sam, I know the second we talked about this podcast as a thing, you really wanted to host a episode about the gods. What exactly was it about this topic that really got you excited. Well, Tyler, I'm so glad you asked. In case it was not abundantly clear, I am a huge nerd. But my particular nerd uh, areas of expertise are historical things. So I was the kid that had posters of the Egyptian pantheon on my wall next to my boy band posters. (laughs) Solid. Amazing, right? And you just don't get to talk enough about like Roman and Greek and Egyptian gods in real life. (laughs) So why not talk about the fictional ones? So thank you for giving me a ridiculous platform with which to speak about things that I don't get to talk about enough in real life. Always happy. Always happy to help. Are you saying you don't go to your job and you're like, hey, everybody, let's talk about the Greek pantheon today? Gosh, the times that kids will bring up things in my office that I can get excited about is just always unfortunate because then they are never as excited as I am and it becomes very strange. <laughs> so I'm glad that you brought this up as like a side quest where we're getting off the beaten path because we're going to take a little bit of a road trip today. Okay. Where we live, it's uh, gotten a little warmer. The weather is a little bit nicer. So it's that season where you get invited to to picnics, to large gatherings. Sure. So today we're going to go on what we're going to call a family reunion Ooh, of sorts. Oh, okay. Is, that a, <clears throat> is this a fun adventure? We'll find out. So, Tyler and Ryan, give me what is your uh, general vibe of a family reunion? Awkward. Super awkward. <laughs> my my last experience with a family reunion was when my mom said we were going to go visit all of her cousins. And in my head, I was thinking just her brothers, who we saw in all my cousins, which we saw all the time. So I was like, perfect, we had to go hang out. And no, it was the other side of the family's Mm -hmm. cousins, and I knew literally no one. Yeah, you walk into the room, you're like, I know 50% of the people here. Excellent. Yeah, and then so I just sat with my parents, and then people would be like, oh, Tyler, you looked, you're so much bigger than you were last time. And I'm like, (laughs) I don't remember last time, so I must have been an infant. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing, yes. So that's the vibe that I want you to carry with you through this episode. 
we're going to take the perspective of while we're visiting all of our gods and deities, we have shown up at a family reunion and these people have all known each other forever. Perfect. We have not. Okay. And our mom or parent or guardian or whomever <laughs> is going to be explaining who the heck all these people are. I love it. The whole time. I love it. And we may only remember that Uncle Bob is a drunk. We may only remember that Aunt Susan has a baller potato salad. Ooh, okay. But that's okay. We just want the flavor. Fair. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, as we embark on our family reunion, we all get in the car, we pack up our stuff, everybody's got headphones, we got Game Boys, it's fine. Your mom says, no, put it away. I have to give you some background before we get to the reunion. <laughs> okay. Up front, everyone pay Up attention. Front. We need to know what, what's about to go down. <laughs> We're going to talk about the last time everybody got together, Ooh. all in one room, or in the case of gods and deities, all in the same plane. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go way, way back. We're going to go back to... Ten ages before what we've been currently talking about. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about Rovagug. Ooh, oh Rova the, Rovagug. We Rovagug. mentioned him. I think twice. Maybe twice. Because he came up in Taldor. That's true, yeah. And then he came up in the first episode. Rovagug. Yes. Excellent. So Rovagug, not to be confused with Range Rovers or <laughs> any other types of appliances that you might be thinking of. He gets the lovely title of the Rogue Beast. Ooh. He's mm -hmm. chaotic evil and his domains are wrath and destruction. Ah, love it. Great at parties. Excellent time <laughs> overall. So way, way back, his whole thing is, I just really want to destroy the world, guys. Yeah. Sounds right. As chaotic evil does. Yes. So naturally, everybody else in the God fam is like, well, we're not totally into that. Right. So you have this lovely unifying moment between all of these different gods that might not normally band together because they do actually want the world to stay intact for the most part, whether you are good, evil, or neutral. Hmm. Yeah, like once drunk uncle decides to try to burn the house down, yes. everyone unites and is like, um, it's maybe like, mm, someone will get the fire extinguisher. We might not agree with each other, but we all agree <laughs> that this house is necessary for our life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So this is where we're going to meet all of these fun people and kind of hear a little bit about who they are, what they did in this particular event, and then how that carries out. Okay. So we're going to talk about a lot of people. It's fine. You don't have to remember okay. all of them. There will not be a test. Perfect. Except maybe there will. I'm not telling. Ooh. Oh, mm. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So first, the gods come up with a plan. They're gods. They've got big brains, presumably. Right. So they figure out... A way to trap Rovagug. Now, typically with gods, you're not like just making them disappear, like killing them super easily. There's obviously all these like big arduous tasks that you have to go to. Right. So we are going to trap him. Okay. First, we're going to talk about Saren Ray. Okay. 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 This is the Dawn Flower. She's the neutral good goddess of sun, redemption, honesty, healing. She comes in with a flaming sword. I love women so with like flaming swords. So like your favorite swords. aunt who just... Is super nice to everybody and also kind of a badass. <laughs> yes. She is running out into the street and saving the dog and standing in front of the car and saying, Stop! Yeah, I love it. You're not running the dog over. Love Perfect. it. And then maybe she'll slash your tires afterward. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> oh. I mean, she's still good. It's like justice. That's, oh, yeah, right. that's fair. Slash the person, that person's tires. Not well, yeah, they tires. ran they ran a stop sign. Uh, yes. So they deserved to have their tires slashed. Yes. That's fair. Okay. Yeah, exactly. okay. Checks out. So she starts us off in this epic battle montage to capture Rovagug. She slices a hole in the world to open a rift. Oops. Ooh, okay. With her awesome flaming sword. And this is the world of Galarian? Yes. Okay. Yes. There were several other worlds that Rovagug ate. Oh. Uh, but they were not as cool as Galarian, oh, okay. so people were not as excited about <laughs> saving them. Rip those other worlds, I suppose. <laughs> those, are, those are the houses we didn't care about. <laughs> you might have burned down the beach house. Is Uncle Bob an arsonist? <laughs> So, she rips the hole open. Excellent. Perfect. Now, what are we actually going to put into this rift and hole? Yeah. Well, what we are going to put in it is the dead vault. Ooh, okay. Which, I love a dramatically named prison. Yeah. Who yeah. doesn't? You have to name it. Yes. So, but we have to build a dead vault first, mm -hmm. right? So, this is where we meet Gorum and Torag. Okay. Nice. Who are more gods. So, Gorum... Our Lord in Iron is a chaotic neutral god. He is over the domains of strength and battle and weapons. And Torag is the father of creation. 
He is lawful good over the forge protection strategy. So they are getting together and they are forging this vault okay. that we are going to put our nasty Uncle Gug in because he can't keep it together. Can you can you take a quick aside and explain for those of you who are listening and don't necessarily understand the different alignments? Can you kind of ex- explain the alignment system a little bit? Oh my gosh, Tyler, you haven't explained alignments? Look, there's a lot of things to go over, okay? <laughs> We're just okay. traveling. We didn't care about alignments. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so in general, <laughs> you have the good and evil spectrum. Mm-hmm. So you can be evil, you can be good, you can be neutral. Checks okay. out. Neutral's in the middle. Makes sense. And then our second axis that we're looking at is going to be that lawfulness or chaoticness. So you can be lawful, you can be chaotic, you can again be neutral. So typically the icon that you'll see will be a three by three, nine square. So you can be like really, really neutral on everything and be straight up in the middle. You can be chaotic good, which is like your Robin Hoodie type, Mm -hmm. steal from the rich, give to the poor, Woo, doing what I want, kind of my own good tenants over here. You can be lawful good where you're like, nope, there are rules and we are going to follow them (laughs) and not murder people. That's very important. If you are good, you should not be murdering people. Yeah. Just FYI. And then we have our evil sides of the spectrum where you might have your lawful evil, which is typically a little bit easier to deal with because they at least have a code of conduct. Whereas like chaotic evil is like, Woo! There are no rules. I'm destroying everything. I do not care about anyone or what anyone thinks. So Uncle Gug is chaotic evil. Yes. A word of caution. Don't be a chaotic evil person in a party if nobody else is. <laughs> yep. It's not going to go well. So yes, this is where we land. Perfect. So so yes, our, our main antagonist in this moment is chaotic evil, not working well with anyone. Yeah. Everybody else has a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more uh, structure right. going on. Cool. So dead vault. Yay. We built it. Now with any good dead vault or prison, we have to put more magic into it to make sure that it does not, you know, fall apart. Look at his way out. Yes. Of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway. So we call on Phrasma. So Phrasma, love her. She is our lady of the graves. She is a true neutral. She is over faith, death, prophecy, and birth. If we want to like tie this back to pantheons we are familiar with, she's going to be like your kind of Hades figure where she okay. is the gateway for souls once they have departed the earth. A little bit different for her, though, is she is there to send souls to the plane that they belong to. Mm. So it's not really a judgment of whether or not you are good or bad. It's more of a which box do you need to go in okay. now that you have passed away? Okay. She is very against the undead, though. That'd be her big, like, no-no. Well, yeah, because once they're dead, they got to stay dead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's like, don't take back what's mine. Fair. It showed up here. It stays here. <laughs> no takesies, backsies. <laughs> None. So she's magical. She's throwing stuff into the dead vault. Keep it in here. So then we have to actually get him into the dead vault, Uh which is where we're going to use some more of our fun friends at this family reunion. We are going to have our, um, how do we say... Our, I don't want to call her our slutty cousin, but like, <laughs> I kind of want to call her our slutty cousin. Anyway, Calistria lures him in, and I also love her. I'm just really into all the lady goddesses. We're just out here kicking ass. It's That's great. Fair. Yeah. She's called the Savored Sting. Her uh, favored animal is a wasp. The Savored? So, Sting. Savored yeah. Sting. Oh, okay. Like you get stung, but you like it a little. Okay. It's an apt description. <laughs> <laughs> She's chaotic neutral, and she is over trickery, lust, and revenge. Fun fact, a lot of her churches are also brothels. Oh, okay. Amazing. So she's luring him in. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of details on how exactly that looked, but I think we can all use our imaginations. (laughs) So she lures him in. Yes. Amazing. He's in the dead vault. And then another one of our fun friends, a god by the name of Dubral, impales him into the dead vault with the star towers, which are things that still exist in different places on Galarian as towers. In this particular instance, they are used to spike this dude into the vault. Okay. And that, like, sticks him. Yes. Okay. Yes, so he is stuck in there. The interesting thing about Dubral that we'll bring up is he later becomes a different deity called Zonkathon. Ooh. After he gets into a fight with his sister, Shaylin, who is 
the goddess of art and beauty and music and they're like jiving in harmony and then something goes down and then he pieces out for another plane and then he kind of gets like taken over by some evil shit Mm. in the other plane and he comes back as this like kind of like sadomasochist like dude in a lot of leather and spiky things oh okay that's a he had like a summer like a summer abroad (laughs) <laughs> Very far abroad. Oh, really rough. <laughs> Went to Amsterdam. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he comes back lawful evil oh. and becomes the uh, god of envy, pain, and loss, oh. and um, just all around super fun times. Perfect. So even deities have like siblings. Yes, case. yes, they can. So they all have different relationships. Yeah. So Shailen that we mentioned is his sister. She is tied to Saren Ray, our flaming sword goddess, um, and they are also tied to Desna, okay. who also is part of this conflict. They are just a group of uh, lady lovers. Oh, oh, hanging nice. out. Okay, nice. So Desna, who doesn't have a specific role in the conflict, but was against Rova Gug, uh, she is the great dreamer. She's chaotic good. She's over dreams and stars and travelers. She's a very popular goddess in Galarian, especially with, like, travelers and adventurers, so she might pop up a lot. Maybe she's, like, over at the table, like, holding on to Uncle Gug's car keys. Like, well, I'm not directly involved, but I'm not gonna let him drive home. <laughs> yes. She I'll is step in cousin. if I need to. <laughs> <laughs> she's your cousin who studied abroad a yeah. lot. Yeah. She's like, oh, do you want to hear about that time that I traveled to this other country? Or this time I did this? And your mom's like, oh, don't tell that story. She's <laughs> yeah. that one. Okay. Like yeah, yeah. So we have him in there, he's spiked in with the towers, and then we have to lock him into this vault. Of course. Mm -hmm. So Abadar, who is a lawful neutral god, uh, master of the first vault, he's over cities and wealth and merchants, Mm -hmm. he has made a key that will lock this dude in here, keep him in. Why he did this, I don't know, but he created this key that only Asmodeus could turn. Okay. Presumably as a fail safe, so that way, like, you couldn't come back and like, oh, I'm just going to unlock him later. Not what we're into. So Asmodeus binds him into the dead vault. Asmodeus is a very popular god in Cheliax. Yep. yep. <laughs> so you'll see him very soon. Uh, he is also a little bit evil. And by little bit evil, I mean lawful evil. So still one of the ones that, like, you can, you know, deal with, not totally doing crazy things. He has a million titles. I would like to share with you a few of them because I think they are fabulous. Uh, Lord of Darkness, Lord of the Pit, Master of Witches, Prince of Darkness, (laughs) Prince of Law, Ruler of Hell, the Archfiend, the Dark Prince, just Anything that you want that sounds, like, fairly nefarious, so he, he's got it. He's like the uncle that just really likes every kid calling him different nicknames. Like, he, he lies about, you know, what his, you know, stories are. Like, oh, but I was in the war. I once saved a bunch of kids from a burning building. I don't know. He's definitely also passing out alcohol to the underage. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, you know, back in college, they called me the Lord of Darkness. <laughs> He's over pride, <laughs> slavery, and tyranny. Oh, great. So extra fun things yeah, extra great. as well. So yes, let's trust him with a fabulous key to lock a dude in a vault. It's fine. Fair. So then he's in. He's locked in. Shaylin, she comes back in. She closes up that rift that she opened. And that is where Rovarug has been imprisoned. However, Rovarug still has followers. So there are still people that believe that he will break out of this prison eventually. And everyone else that rose up against him, which is basically everybody. Well, I believe he was, or he, he kind of influenced the Tarrasque we talked about in the Taldor episode, Yeah, right? the Tarrasques are like spawns of Rovarug. Yeah. So they, he still has, so like... So he can kind of like influence things outside the vault, even though he's stuck in there. So the the place that he is imprisoned is, we think, the pit of Gormuz. Okay. On the cool. continent of Kasmarin. Oh, cool. In the windswept wastes. And this region, there's lots of bad monsters and things. Like, so it's like you planted something really nasty and now there's like nasty stuff growing sure. up out of your garden. Sure. Yeah, this is the sh- one, if you think of the inner sea region, kind of the middle this is east between Inner Sea Region and Tien Sha, mm-hmm. Kasparan. And that ends the Age of Creation. Mm. So that, that big event, that last big family <laughs> reunion, ends the Age of Creation. And straight on to the Age of Serpents. <laughs> so, age of Serpents! <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, the family, like all, they get, they get Uncle Gug together, they like put him in the back of the police cruiser, and they're like, okay, 
We never speak of this night again. <laughs> yes. If we make a pact, just never talk about it. <laughs> we will not meet again in one place for the next 5,000 years to talk about this. Perfect. Exactly. And that's just what your mom really needs you to know <laughs> as you walk in and meet all of these people. I would be extremely wide-eyed if that was the talk my mom gave me. Like, hey, last time, you know, we might have imprisoned your Uncle Gun. Oh. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a... I don't know. I'll call that successful. Yeah. That seems like a successful reunion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's very dramatic. There was a lot of people involved, maybe some high stakes conflict. I like it. But everyone did come together in a moment. So it all works out in the end. Excellent. (laughs) Everybody always bonds together when they're talking shit about that one (laughs) family member who can't get it together. (laughs) Or end of the world always brings people together. That's true. true. Yeah, that's true. Again, Uncle Gug was an arsonist. We can all we can all agree that Uncle Gug needs to go to prison. That's fair. That's fair. So we've made it to the reunion. Okay. Love it. We're going to walk in. We're going to like meet some of these people, but we're also going to notice like a little bit of an elephant in the room. You know that feeling like someone should be here, but they're not. That vibe you get that, oh, I think something's happened, but I'm not entirely sure what. It's like sure. no one's talking about something. And you're not exactly sure what yeah, that's like talking is. around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So that thing is Aroden. Oh, friend mm. of the pod. Friend of the pod. So tell me, what have you talked about with Aroden so far? What do you know? So we know that Aroden showed up mm-hmm. as the last Aslanti. Mm-hmm. He rose the star stone, found it, which was the one of the meteors for Earthfall. Yep. And he brought up basically the Isle of Absalom, became a god. Kind of pieced out. Kind of pieced out for a bit, and then was supposed to come back and did it. And he, he did. Died. Yeah, did. He did. And ev- everyone had plans for him to come back. Every single, every single time it doesn't work out. Everybody had d- different plans. It's like, I'm going to be the one who hangs out with Aroden. I'm, I'm in his posse, not you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that is him. Just some things that I want to pull out of his story as fun facts and nodules i guess so when he raises the star stone yeah he takes the star stone test the test of the star stone which is part of how he ascends into godhood which will become an important thing as we move forward in time the prophecy that you mentioned so everybody's saying that he's going to come back and then whoops he (laughs) does not that is what brings in the Age of Lost Omens. So that's going to be another one of those like trigger events Mm -hmm. that moves us into the current age. Yeah. So again, this is many ages past when we locked Rovagug in things. But there's some really big kind of world forming things that happen here. So the test of the Star Stone now is something that people can attempt. Right. All the time. Yes. However... Only three people have passed it. No. I would love to see the ratio on like the, the attempts versus not. I imagine you have either... I, I think it'd be funny if they had like a chart outside the Starstone <laughs> Cathedral that's just like number of successes. There's like three marks and the number of failures and it's just like an entire wall. <laughs> <clears throat> Even better, I need like the the factory sign days since the star <laughs> since failed ascent. star stone test. <laughs> I think like it maybe some needs to be guard. minutes or hours. <laughs> minutes. Since. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think people are taking it that often. Like it sounds. It sounds like whenever people attempt it, like a crowd develops. Yeah. So it can't be like every hour. That's true. It's also fairly arduous and like takes some time. Yeah. So what the actual test is, is a little bit of a mystery on exact content. We know that you have to get into the cathedral right. in the center of Absalom. The star stone is surrounded by this maze that has traps and guardians and wards. But the obstacles change depending on who is taking the test. No one really knows exactly what they're going to face when they get in there. The few people that do pass, obviously, get into godhood. A lot of people die. (laughs) And then some people manage to escape partway through, which is, I guess, encouraging. Love it. They might get a lot of wealth, so they didn't come away empty-handed. Yeah, okay. But no divinity, so... A little column A, a little column B. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the people who did ascend. So these are going to be people that actually passed the test and are now showing up to the family reunion. Ooh. Because <laughs> they can come now. They have gotten the invite. Man, nice. nice. 
The first person to do so is Norgerber. Norgerber. <laughs> Big fan of Norgerber. <laughs> I hate his name. It's so hard to say. <laughs> like, Cool Dini, which is the dumbest name. Yeah. Oh my like, gosh. So cool. And I'm like, Norgerber. Anyway, <laughs> not much is known about him as a mortal. He pretty much shut that down and did not want anyone to know who he was before. Probably a big nerd. <laughs> I hope so. But now he is the neutral evil god mm. over greed and secrets and poison and murder. But he has multiple titles because uh, he has a multifaceted nature. So, for example, thieves revere the Grey Master, whereas assassins and alchemists revere Black Fingers. So okay. he kind of uses different names and the different aspects of himself. Black Fingers. I, I don't like that. It's because you're murdering people. Yeah. Death Fingers. That's not an intimidating... Yeah. I don't know. It's like if you're going to be like the god of murder, like the, the Black Fingers is not... Like, so, <laughs> I've been sent by it. The Black Fingers. And you're like, really? C- can we workshop that can I, name can I a little bit? Can I the Lord of Darkness instead? Like, <laughs> Look, guys, if you show up in some shady alley and some dude's back there and he's like, let me just shake your hand and he's got like fully black hands, you're like, I don't know about this. Uh, that's fair. I guess. Yeah. Like, is death creeping up? I don't know. I don't know. Is it poison? Is it I'd still rather be killed by the Lord of Darkness. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> That's fair. He That's got fair. taken out by the black <laughs> fingers. <laughs> we don't mention we don't mention that part anymore. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> oh, so anyway, he's in the pantheon now. Cool. He cool. was the first one. The second person to take the test and pass is Caden Kellyan. Love him. Love awesome. Caden Kellyan. So we do know who he was as immortal. He apparently doesn't care. He was Talden. And a cell sword and a freedom fighter. Okay. And he yeah. drank a lot. And he drank a lot. Hilariously, he gets drunkenly dared to take the test of the Starstone. And more hilariously, he passes. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't remember how he did it. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> We've all been there. I wish the drunken things that I don't remember resulted in me getting godhood versus me waking up and going, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the, uh, yeah, the, the, the bits of flashes of last night aren't like, I did what? <laughs> With who? I, oh, oh, that was a mistake. Yeah. Instead he's, I did what? With who? <laughs> oh. <laughs> cool. Very different. Looks tone. down at hands. Oh, I'm a god. Okay, cool. Also, I love it that Paizo wrote in a... Here's a deity that just accidentally stumbled into it. We can all aspire to that, though. I know. Yeah, that, that that's like the everyman's deity. Yeah. And as such, he is known as the accidental god that's and the <laughs> drunken god. And he is chaotic good, as we could assume. And he is over the domains of freedom and ale and bravery. Love it. Perfect. Beautiful. I'm a fan. So he's fabulous. We love him. Our third ascended and the most recent is Iomade. We also know who she was prior to taking the test. She was a Chalaxian human who fought against the Whispering Tyrant. So lots of valiant deeds in her lifetime. Yeah. She takes the test of the Starstone, ascends. She becomes a goddess that's neutral good over honor and justice and valor. She's connected to Aridin. She becomes his herald until he passes, at which point she takes over most of his followers Fair. and she gains her title as the inheritor because she oh. has inherited mm. what he had okay before. cool yeah so fun new people into the mix it doesn't happen very often we don't get a lot of brand new deities uh but those are our like fun young hip people at the party I like it's one of them's like you know maybe trying to assassinate people in the corner one's getting drunk and one's over here telling war stories but yeah. you know take your pick you know <laughs> The youngins just yeah. doing their thing. Over there, having adventures. Mm-hmm. So that's the family reunion. We've met people. We've walked around. We vaguely know who some of these people are. Yeah, yeah. It's great. So the great thing about gods and deities in the world of Flarian is there's a lot of variation. So who we just met today are going to be the most popular gods that you'll see worshipped. Yeah. And they typically fall into that inner sea region. However, we have a whole planet, so each continent is going to have gods that they're going to worship that are going to be a little bit different. There's going to be different races that are going to go towards certain gods over others. The elves have a whole pantheon. The dwarves (laughs) do. There's a god for everything you might need, essentially. Love it. 
So it's always a great thing to look at who might be related to your character or the region that you're in that you could potentially use for flavor. Mm. So yeah. thanks for attending the reunion. I hope you guys got some potato salad. Aren't too freaked out. We won't do another one of these for like six more ages. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great when we do. Yes. Love it. Perfect. Love it. Thank you, Sam. This has been a great kind of introduction to the family. And so we will take a quick break, hear a word from our sponsors, and then come back. And I think you have some uh, good campaign ideas of how to leverage gods in your in your campaign. We'll be right back. Greetings, adventurer. Are you tired of carrying your loot in a bag of holding, only to find that your wealth is never growing, only diminishing? Bring your wealth to the Church of Abadar. The master of the first vault can increase your wealth. It just requires a little interest. You can find us in every major city in Avistan. We are ready to handle your wealth. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We are still talking about gods and deities here in the Tabletop Travel Guide. <laughs> and we are going to talk about how do we put them in to our campaigns or our yeah. characters. I think sometimes there's a lot of men mechanics when we're looking at character building and sometimes we skip over the deities because that's like another level that we have to think about one more thing yeah yes but there's some really cool flavor things that can come in with deities and i think sometimes it's very helpful in character building there's some things that'll be kind of set out for you that can give you a direction so i just want to go over some of the cool things that you can do with deities in your campaigns. If you are running a campaign, you can always have your characters be on a quest under a certain deity mm -hmm. or impacted by a region that reveres a deity or maybe the society's structure is yeah. going to be impacted by that. If we mm -hmm. think about when you guys talk about Cheliax, very <laughs> uh, focused on what Asmodeus has going on. That's Some a region. Some minor influences. <laughs> well, and, we, and we haven't hit, hit it yet, but Nidal... Which is, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned Zonkathon earlier. That's literally that entire yeah. country is based around the worship of Zonkathon, which yeah. will. Yeah, so there's lots of ways that it can be really relevant and really cool flavor for your campaigns. Yeah. When we're looking at characters, I want to just highlight some things in the building process that can be influenced by your deity. So I'm going to use Iomide, who we talked about most recently, yeah. as my example as we go through, just because it's a little bit easier to talk about it when it's specific. Mm -hmm. So deities have favored weapons, which can be a very cool mechanic for a character. So in the case of Iomide, it's a long sword. Big fan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Classic. Classic. So if you use your deity's favored weapon, you are going to get some bonuses when you use it. So that might help you if you were trying to decide, oh, I want a melee character, but I'm not really sure where to go with them. If I pick my deity first, well, I definitely want to use the long sword because yeah. that gives me the bonuses and that can help give me a direction as I'm building. Right. Easy choice. Yeah. Yes. You're also going to want to consider like lining up with their alignment. Mm -hmm. So typically deities have their alignment, but then alignments that will fall into their realm. So you don't necessarily have to match exactly, but you have to match on some levels. Yeah. So for Iomide, who's lawful good, if you are a person that is following her, you could also be neutral good. You could be lawful neutral and still be fine to follow her. You're not going to really want to be a chaotic evil or any type <laughs> of evil character. It's not going to go well. Right. Each deity has followers. So there might be like lay people. There might be clergy. There might be more battle focus. So that's where we get into our clerics and our paladins and those fun things. You can maybe go to their holy sites. You can maybe go to their temples. You can worship. The fun thing that I like to do with deities is to consider their boons and banes. So this is a mechanic where if you worship a deity, they might favor you with some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you make them mad, they might disfavor you <laughs> with some not fun stuff. Fun is the That's GM. Fair. Yeah. Yes. In Iomade's case, she has several boons that you can get depending on like the level of a worshiper that you are. It might be certain spells that you might get. It can be certain actions that you might be able to do or advantages that you might get in certain situations. It's really great flavor. It can really enhance your role play experience or give you something to do if you have no idea what to do with your character. Nice. Yeah. 
So yeah, uh, Ryan and I did not come unprepared. We, Shocking. Right? We came with a couple characters. <laughs> yes. Uh, we decided that we wanted to kind of, you know, show a more expected character that will worship a deity in kind of an unexpected way. Yes. So I'll start. And I built a war priest cleric of Besmara. So we need to talk about Besmara in please help. this episode. Don't know who that is. Yeah, so Besmara is, uh, her moniker is the Pirate Queen. Okay, I'm back in it. Yeah, so she's chaotic neutral. And she basically kind of, she became, she started out as kind of a spirit and then grew into a deity by kind of stealing other people's power. And, mm. you know, there was like when people made sacrifices to the, by seafaring people, she kind of became more powerful. So she's kind of become the patron goddess of pirates. Her invitation to the reunion probably got lost at sea. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or she's like, look, I'm not coming to the reunion. I'm over here pillaging. And so her tenets are literally sail the seas, stay loyal to captain and crew, take what you want. Okay. Um, yeah. And if you forsake piracy, she kind of hates you a little bit. So, or if you settle on land, so, so she's very much the if like. You settle on if land. You settle on land. You know what? You're gonna be <laughs> out on the sea. So I built a character that worshipped Besmara. Her name is Morgan Riptide Bartram. Riptide. Riptide. Now, is Riptide the given middle name, or is that it is a it is the moniker? It is the moniker she gets mm. after becoming a cleric of Besmara. Do you uh, get a sweet C name when you become a cleric? That's awesome. No, uh, I mean, maybe. I don't know. But she be- she's the captain of a ship. She's the captain of the Revenge Tide. Amazing. Uh. So she grew up in the Shackles. We talked about the Shackles in the first episode. Basically, Pirate Haven. And her mom was a bartender at one of the bars. Her dad was a ship worker. Okay. And, the- and Morgan was obsessed with pirates and sailing, as you might be being from the Shackles. So all of them were devout followers of Besmara. That's kind of everybody to some extent in the shackles probably reveres Besmara to an extent. You might as even if you're like not super, you even might if as well hedge a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You might as well just be like quick prayer to Besmara for yeah. whatever. So as she grew up, Morgan learned sailing from her father and basically kind of had a knack for it and picked it up really quickly. You know, he was a ship worker, but she just excelled at basically anything she taught mm-hmm. or anything he uh, she was taught. Each port in the shackles is kind of run by a free captain. Which are kind of the, they, they form the pirate councils. It's close you can have to a government. Each one kind of rules their port however they do. So in her case, their island was kind of run by a corrupt kind of piece of crap free captain. But it didn't mm. affect them much. You know, those corrupt pirates as opposed to those. Look, I mean, <laughs> I love a good pirate story, okay? You might have a good honorable pirate. Okay. So it didn't affect them too much until one day some of the captain's thugs or crew or whatever were in her mom's bar. And started causing a ruckus, doing, you know, stuff beyond what was cool for the bar. Her mom Not tr- chill. Not chill. Her Super mom not tries chill. to stop them, basically gets on the bad side of the thugs, and then therefore the free captain, and uh, without going into too many details, ends up dead. Ah, the typical Disney princess story. Typical Disney princess story. Sad. So... Hate to see it. Yeah. So mom gets murdered. Hearing the news... Morgan prayed to Besmara to have to get power to take revenge. And this is when she becomes a war priest. Uh, oh, she gets a blessing love it. from Besmara to gain the powers <laughs> to Sail become the a high cleric. seeds and pillage. Yeah. So her and her dad, they steal a ship. They gather a crew based on, you know, some of the regulars at the bar, some of the ship workers he knows. They basically kind of form a ragtag crew, steal a ship. She becomes captain of it. She has powers to heal and to manipulate water and you know kind of excels at being a pirate captain that's when she gets the moniker riptide because she has abilities that you know when people have tried to board her ship she can just use like manipulate water to send them back off the ship and Mm. doing you know stuff like that sam how does this compare to your father daughter work days oh jeez if only i could knock people off of boats and (laughs) suck them back into the ocean i would get so much more done yeah so so she you know her Deity's favorite weapon is the rapier, so she can duel. That's why she's kind of a war priest. But she gets the moniker Riptide on the Revenge Tide. And her whole goal, her dad is the first mate, so they're kind of father-daughter pirating the seas and looting and doing all that as kind of a long-burn revenge quest to both 
Their, their, their goal is to win the free captain's regatta, which mm-hmm. we talked about in the first episode. Right. Basically, around the hurricane, you win, you get an island, you get a pirate council seat, um, you become you become a free captain. With the bonus of she's going to murder the crap out of the free captain that sure. killed her mom. Yeah. Amen, so, sister. Right? So all of her powers are mechanically from Besmara. Right. So she cannot be a cleric without a deity. Right. So that's kind of, you know, the, the more general, most people who pick deities just from a mechanical sta- standpoint are clerics or paladins. Right. So yeah. So Ryan, what do you got? I just want to say, I don't want to get on Riptide's wrong side. Riptide? Um, I would like to say that for Riptide, what I would love to see for her life is that she gets the boon from Besmara that is bribing a sea monster. Ooh. I'm okay. sorry, what? Yes. One of the boons from Besmara is bribed sea monster. The sea monsters at Besmara's behest follow your call at the goddess's command. <laughs> Amazing! I think she needs that. I love it. Oh, yeah, do that. Yeah, okay, for cool. sure. Cool. Well, my character would not be friends with Riptide at all. Fair. Yeah, so I made Rarfu the orc. Okay. Uh, a lot less, you know, not like intensity, but there's a lot less going on in Rarfu's family. Yeah. So mother was a fighter, father was a fighter. They all live in Belkson. Okay. You know, orcs going to fight. Uh, the only kind of weird weird little edge is uh, Rarfu wasn't super vocal. Like, my, at least my perception of orcs is they're like super loud and super boisterous and want to get out there and like make their presence heard. And Rarfu wasn't really, wasn't really like that. Um, was a good fighter, pretty solid, but at some point picked up a drum. Ooh. Picked up a drum and decided, you know, maybe maybe my my talents aren't just fighting, but they're also in drumming. Okay. And that's where Rarfu's career really kicks off. Rarfu becomes a very competent bard of Gorum. Yes. A war bard of Gorum. So Rarfu kind of slams the drums as his friends and family enter battle and in- both inspires them with like your generic bardic inspiration but is also well-kitted for stoic intimidation and fear (laughs) effects. And so mechanically, I kind of leaned more into Gorham's intimidation and war side. Yeah. And where, like, a lot of your stereotypical bards are very buff-focused. Rarfu is very out there debuffing the enemy and intimidating and, like, throwing sound at them and just generally causing a ruckus with his large drums and intimidating gaze that's really cool all the flavor of gorum like doesn't directly give him any power correct yeah there's nothing mechanically that rarfu gets from being a, a follower of gorum but it's but. yeah super influential in the character building however there is a very cool boon from gorum that would work well for him that one is gorum's shout which allows you to once per day use Word of Chaos as a spell-like ability. So you must shout a battle cry at top volume. Or maybe it's hitting the drums at top volume. So even if it's not a character that like lines up exactly with what like the deity's got going on or we're not using it specifically like a cleric, there are always ways that you can pull it in and make it work. Yeah, well, that could even work. Like, you know things have gotten serious if Rarfu actually opens his mouth. Yeah. Then it's doubly scary. The drums plus, like, the shouting. Ooh. I like it. I like it. I like Rarfu. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you to all of our listeners. We hope you're enjoying listening as much as we're enjoying making these episodes. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. If you have any thoughts, feel free to reach out to us via email, tabletoptravelguide at gmail.com. Likewise, if you want to head to our website, we'll post some pictures. We post any characters we make on here. We post the full character sheets. TabletopTravelGuide.com. Anything else, guys? Thanks for having me. This was really fun, and I liked nerding out. Oh, yeah. Yes, this will be the first of, I'm sure, many guest hosts and first of many tabletop lore guides. So we'll we'll sprinkle them in as we go through the, the world and we explore. Yeah. But with all that said, until then, guys, happy travels. Safe travels. Mm-hmm.